Welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Balkaran. More importantly, you, you're looking for inspired insight, which you can apply to everyday life. And perhaps you care for a tale or two. If you resonate with ancient spiritual wisdom and live storytelling, then this is for you. So our last um, episode was on the goddess. I told a story from the Devi Mahatmya, the greatness of the goddess, and reflected on the purpose and the principle of power. It was the famous Mahishasura Mardini episode, the episode where the goddess slays the buffalo demon. This is her, uh, by far her most uh, famous, popular, mythic moment, um, celebrated iconographically throughout South Asia and beyond. It's resplendent goddess in her multi-arm form, uh, 8, 12, 18, you name it. Um, Weapons galore, but gorgeous and smiling and triumphant and peaceful. Um, Astride her lion or her lion nearby, where she is skewering (laughs) using her shula, her, her spear, to end the life of the, the stubborn buffalo demon. And why is this triumphant? Because this is the demon who stole the power of the gods. And why is this important? Because when <laughs> when those who are not uh, equipped to wield power usurp power, there is a problem not just for that post, not just for the position of power, which was usurped, but for all who relate to that position. As we well know in modern times, when there is an individual in charge who should not be in charge, whether on the level of employment, community, municipal, provincial, um, you know, national, then there's a problem. So the destruction of Mahishasura, the buffalo demon, coincided with the restoration of the rightful authority and power of Indra and the gods. And they sing glorious praises, as you may recall, the Chakradi Stuti, the most ornate and beautiful Sanskrit in the Devi Mahatmya, this, this first, um, first iteration of the great goddess in ancient India. The text is called the Devi Mahatmya, the, the greatness, the grandeur, the glory, the glorification, Mahatmya, of the Devi, of the goddess. And so, upon singing her praises, she says, look, I uh, would like to give you a wish. So please, by your praise, what would you like? Let me reward you. And they were like, wait, this wasn't a please. This was a thank you praise. You know, we we were thanking you for already accomplishing our aim. But such is the wisdom of ancient India, where the, the idea of, 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 of finitude and linear thinking is incongruent with the cyclical and, 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 and multifaceted fabric of life. And so they realized, look, just because you've restored our power now doesn't mean it may not be usurped again in future. Such is the ebb and flow, the highs and lows of life. And so they wisely said, well, thank you. We, we, we accept your boon. Just please come back when we need you. And she said, no problem. Whenever you remember me, Smriti is an important concept. It's really fascinating and important theological concept in In Hinduism, smriti, the act of remembrance, is important, right? How important is it to remember teachings (laughs) in times of duress? And there is an entire body of text, all that was not revealed, shruti, heard, i.e. the the Vedic hymns and the Upanishads, Vedanta, is considered smriti, all of the Mahabharata, all of the Ramayana, the two great Sanskrit epics. All of the 18 Mahapuranas and various Upapuranas and voluminous <laughs> is the class of Smriti, that which was remembered. The connotation here is that it, unlike Shruti, revelation, which is considered unauthored, aparusheya, channeled, revealed. Smriti is considered to, while inspired, be the product of human agency. It's authored, it's parusheya. Vyasa wrote everything, right? <laughs> or Valmiki. 
etc., etc., etc. But the act of remembrance is crucial. And so the boon, the blessing is such that once you remember me in your time of need, in your time of distress, I will return. And saying so, she vanished. And this sets the stage for the second tale. As you might recall, the tales are being told by a sage to a king. Uh, I'm a wisdom teacher named Raj. I'm not sure which I am. Perhaps a bit of both. Who knows? Maybe that's why my PhD work was on the frame narrative <laughs> of the Devi Mahatmya. But the sage declares this episode to the king as the second of three. And then he says, you know, here again, Rakshanaya Chaloka Nam, Deva Nam Bukarni, etc., etc. This is not a Sanskrit crowd. This is an English speaking crowd. So we'll stay with English for now. Um, he says here again, as I relay the glories of the goddess, as she takes form in the world to accomplish the aims of the gods. So, of course, again, demons usurp the throne of heaven. Again, again. This time, not one, but two. Right? So, one of the one of the fascinating things about the structure of the Devi Mahatma is that we have the Mahishasura Mardani, the slaying of the buffalo demon episode, as the um, Majima Charata, the middle episode. And this is important because the text is crafting a sophisticated ring structure. Right? The first, the opening frame mirrors the closing frame. Episode one mirrors episode three, and episode two is the central pillar in the temple of the text, so to speak. But it's a little bit puzzling because Episode two takes up merely chapters three, um, two, three, and four of 13. <laughs> three chapters of 13. And then we have nine chapters. How could this possibly be the middle of the text? It is the middle of the text because tradition has latched into place by calling it uh, Pratamacharita, first act, Madhyama, not the second, not Dvitiya, the middle episode, and not the third, Uttamacharita. Tradition has locked it into place, saying, last. So no more additions. <laughs> this is it. We need the Mahisha Sura Mardini episode to be the Madhima Charata because the, the, the text is showcasing the restoration of royal power. This is precisely what the frame accentuates. Right? Because the king receives his royal, the restoration of his royal power from the goddess. So then why then do we have this sprawling nine chapter third episode well one thing that uh that is argued in the goddess and the king in indian myth by some dude named rosh balkaran is that the text is actually cleverly showing the manifesting power of the goddess the, the power of maya to manifest and multiply and episode one is act one is one chapter Episode one is one chapter. One times three is three. So act two, episode two is three chapters. Three times three is nine. So act three, episode three, or the final one is nine chapters. And so this is quite an evolved episode. Um, I tell it in two to three stories and the stories behind the poses. So I may actually tell a snippet of it today and a snippet of it uh, for our next podcast episode. But while in this middle episode, one demon usurped the throne of Indra, Mahisha, this time not one, but two. Shumba and Nishumba, brothers, usurp the throne of heaven and cast the gods out. To live as mere mortals, imagine that. How terrible could that be? <laughs> the life of a mortal, wandering the earth, bereft of their power, bereft of a share of the 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 the, the, the sacrifices. And so this describes um, a situation out of balance, where order has been compromised. But the gods remembered the boon that they received from the Holy Mother, from the Divine Mother, the Devi. And so they all come together and they literally sing her praises. While the hymn we talked about a moment ago, the Shakradi Studi is a thanksgiving hymn. Thank you. 
This one is a please. It's an uh, invocation hymn. It's summoning the power of the Devi. Now, we don't know if the narrative comes first or the hymn comes first. Um, I suspect hmm, the latter in some cases. Uh, but nevertheless, this hymn is a very, very common, popular hymn throughout the Indic world. It is the famous Ya Devi hymn, right? So Ya Devi Sarva Bhudeshu, to that goddess who abides in all beings. You know, we, we pay obeisance. Namastasye, 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 namo namaha. Um, salutations, obeisance. They use this antiquated English word obeisance in this new translation that I've developed, which has been sitting in my desk for two years. I know, I know. <laughs> I need to carve out some time to, to bang it off, to get it off too. Uh, there's a publisher who's interested in it, but uh, obeisance, obeisance is the word that's being used, okay? Why? To give a sense of the mustasye, the mustasye. So part of what I want to do in the translation is not just convey the meaning, the sense, but also to convey something of the texture, something something of the vibration, if you will, of the Sanskrit. So this very famous hymn, okay? Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, X, in the form of X, and X shifts. Nidra Rupena Samsita, in the form of sleep, Namastasye, 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 namo nama. What do you mean sleep? Well, yes. You know, they, they, they invoke, this is a really, really important theological idea, philosophical, spiritual idea. The gods of heaven are invoking the goddess on high, she who is not just on high, but she who abides in the very biorhythms, sarva bhuteshu, in all beings. In all creatures, male, female, neither mammalian, reptilian, amphibian, and the birds, and the beasts, and humans alike. This is a really profound and important idea. This is a this is a celebration of divine imminence, the extent to which the divine is indwelling in the world not to say this is a binary approach where she is imminent and not transcendent she's both but to my mind her imminence is emphasized and this is important because we have all kinds of discourse about divinity being transcendent uh in the upanishads for example but this text is brilliant because it takes these concepts uh, from the Upanishads, uh, Prakriti, material creation, Maya, the elusive, the illusion that we're all in, or the, the power, the magic uh, of, of, of divinity. Uh, it takes these concepts and it folds them into this vision of the feminine that is supreme. It exalts embodied mundane existence to a status at least as important as moksha or liberation which is so crucial. It's crucial not just to the Indic world, but it's crucial to the world in which we now live, which is why this text is so very, very incredibly important. Severely understudied, but I suppose that gives me a life's work to do. <laughs> um, and part of why... I have a renewed or, or reinvigorated interest in the text. You know, the text is always part of my being. I mean, it's it's a text that I did my PhD work on. Uh, I've done two books on, a number of articles. It's also a text um, which functions, which has a rich ritual life. It is unlike the vast majority of Puranic or narrative or mythological texts. It functions as liturgy. So it functions in ritual. It is ritually chanted, the entirety of the 13 chapters, uh, betwixt some ritual appendages, some other stothrams and, and I suppose, mysteries, rasyas, uh, various ritual applications, uh, such as um, nyasa, ritual establishment in the body. But it, the text is ritually chanted, as, and in that context, it's called the chandipata. It's ritually chanted throughout the Indic world, be it South Asia proper, the diaspora, uh, particularly at the autumnal festival, 
uh, the fall nine nights Navaratri, uh, Durga Puja, Durga festival. And it is a text uh, in which I've received initiation. I've received initiation to the Chandipatha. I have practiced it for a number of years. And it's also a text that I've had the good fortune of dissertating upon. So there's this dual citizenship of both intellectual and experiential, and experiential engagement on the same text. And part of the, the, the renewed, reinvigorated interest is because I recently did a retreat, an in-person retreat in a tiny town in uh, just charming, gorgeous southern Switzerland. And really last year I did a number of Shakti retreats and I thought I would sh- I would shake it up and do something different. And this year just happened to be under the auspices of the spring goddess festival. I didn't plan that actually. That just just happened to be the case. That's when the, the center was free. Um, and given that it was the festival and given that upon arrival, the students were interested in the goddess, I doubled down on Shakti and taught from the Devi Mahatmya. I relayed the entire text to them. And as a text from which I could lecture, from which I could chant, from which I could story tell, um, from which I could share spiritual teachings, it was perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, and so really, it's sort of when you're so in it at times, you can't see it. And I was struck with the the power and importance and revolutionary nature of this work time and time again when I first began studying it. And at this point, it's just part of me. And so this retreat was really important because it helped me to, to, to cognize once again how incredibly important this work is for our times, particularly given our relationship to ecology in the world, particularly given a particular legacy from various traditions of regarding divinity as beyond creation and creation is a created thing that has been bequeathed humanity for its enjoyment or use or dominion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is this has been civilizationally internalized. This is part of the unconscious belief system of our civilization. And this is why we have done as we have done. If you want to learn about a human being's unconscious belief system, all you have to do is look at their actions. They themselves are be confounded why they consciously wish for X or Y or Z or to do a P or Q or R, and yet their actions um, look very differently because the actions stem from the unconscious belief system. And our actions of, as a civilization bespeaks an unconscious internalization of foundational Western narratives, which pejoratively view nature as either an insentient or a created thing and uh, or or at worst uh, a problematic <laughs> pagan object of veneration how dare you revere nature <laughs> and yet this hymn is so important because what this hymn says is the supreme beyond beyond she who's beyond beyond the force the force which propels forth the galaxies abides in all beings in the form of, well, yes, there's sort of lovely, majestic, uh, you know, qualities in the form of splendor, in the form of uh, kanti, loveliness, uh, faith, modesty, tranquility, shanti, patience. We have these virtues. But also she is hymned as she who abides in all beings in the form of hunger, thirst, sleep, Jati, birth itself. Just so we don't mistake this as poetic, the hymn is absolutely clear that she is not different from the very biorhythms of embodied existence. And this is a massive innovation renovation within the Indic world. And it's one which befits the face of the feminine. And it's one which might be of great use for spiritual, philosophical, theological deliberations as we aim to collectively shift how we relate to animals, to ecology, to the planet itself. 
So the gods him, Ya Devi Sarvabute, should chate in it, chate Namastasye, 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 namo, namaha, to the goddess who abides in all beings. She's not insentient. As consciousness itself, obeisance, obeisance, we now bow down. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Buddhi Rupena Samstita. To the goddess who abides in all beings in the form of intelligence, Buddhi. Namastasye, 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 namo, namaha. And so, the various functions mentioned continued. Fascinatingly, one, the penultimate, the, the last one is Bronte, which we, we could think of as confusion, but I sort of think of as bewilderment. The bewilderment of embodied existence and the, 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 the delusive mystery of separation. Bewilderment, Bronte, Rupena, some sort of, but the penultimate one is so telling. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Mathru Rupena Samsita, uh, mother or motherhood type idea, to that goddess who abides in all beings in the form of motherhood. How fascinating is it that all beings, whether masculine or feminine or neither, fascinatingly as well, Sanskrit has these, these genders, <laughs> it understands that there's masculine and feminine and neither. Right? And we're struggling now to integrate the not masculine nor feminine idea, okay? whatever that might be. Um, but irrespective of the gender of the being, that motherhood can be a state or an aspect of all beings. What a fascinating idea. Is this perhaps the state of supreme compassion? Is this perhaps a state where we, in a healthy way, are able to cognize the needs of another? and put the needs of the other first? Is this perhaps the dharma of motherhood? Is, it, is this perhaps related to why all individuals with very high consciousness, all sages, all however you want to think of them, necessarily are, have great empathy and compassion, that somehow compassion and empathy and care for others is an evolute of the raising of awareness. Is this that Mathru, which abides in all beings? Right? And then the, 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 the I might as well share a bit of the ending of the hymn. Indriya nam adishtatri bhuta nam chakileshu ya bhuteshu satatam tasya vyapti devya in the mod namaha chiti rupe na yakuts nam eter vyapasata jagat namastasye 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 namo namaha. Obeisance to she whoever abides in all beings, obeisance to the all powerful, all pervading goddess who resides over the elements and the senses. To she who abides in all beings in the form of consciousness, of awareness, of awakening, pervading this world from beginning to end, obeisance, obeisance, we now bow down. And here we are. So, you know. They continue chanting to her with bodies bent in devotion, remembering now the ruler of worlds, um, asking that she, may she who destroys affliction destroy for us now this demon wrought torment. And what happens? She appears, of course. Otherwise, the invocation wouldn't be so powerful, now would it? <laughs> The, the text is showing you the utility. It's so fascinating. The mythic context is showing you the real-world utility, the, the religious application, the liturgical, ritualistic application of the hymn. But does she, does she arrive? Does she appear out of thin air? No, 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 no such thing. Do you remember the first hymn where she comes out of the body of Brahma, the creator? Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't, but she does. The first episode, she emerges from the body of Brahma. So pardon me. Brahma praises her, and she emerges from the body of Vishnu, because she was Vishnu Maya. She, she was the Yoga Nidra of Vishnu, the Yogic Sleep of Vishnu. Now, in the second episode, all the gods got together, and they were pissed off at the audacity of this buffalo-headed demon to steal the throne of Indra. And from their collective fiery outrage, their tejas, she coalesced. 
Well, here too, she comes out of a being's body. This is extremely important because it's really an homage or an exaltation, a celebration of embodied existence. It's This is a super important idea. Embodied existence is not an obstruction to the divine, as some strands of Indic thought and other traditions would have us think. According to this tradition, embodied existence is an expression of the divine. So, as the gods finish their praise, Parvati, the Shakti of Shiva, uh, the consort of Shiva, comes strolling along and naively asks, Who are you praising, O ye gods? <laughs> and out of Parvati's body from her kosha emerges the goddess, which is called Kaushiki, and says, Well, it's me who they're praising. So again, we have this idea that she is indwelling in all beings, as the hymn so eloquently and overtly puts. And the embodied state is tantamount to her divine presence. Very important, profound idea. So the goddess is manifested and she's sort of sitting there resplendent on the mountainside. You know, a a delight to behold. And along come two henchmen, two servants, if you will, of of the demons who usurp the throne of heaven. Their names again are Shumba and Nishumba. Now these two henchmen are Chanda and Munda. Along come Chanda and Munda. And they behold this beautiful goddess. And they go back to their... (laughs) Masters, and they report something along these following lines. You know, masters, we have come across the most beautiful of women in the mountains and all the worlds. Nowhere has such beauty been seen. She is indeed a jewel among women. And you already possess the finest jewels. You've already usurped the greatest jewels, the greatest elephants and horses, the, the greatest riches of heaven and earth belong to you, is it not fitting then that you should own this jewel among women? It's utterly fascinating that even in a patriarchal culture, there is this very playful cautionary tale against the literally the literal commodification, which is a commodity, and the objectification <laughs> of the feminine form. And of course, the demons, you know, Shumba and Nishumba are like, yes, we'll send, her, send this message to her. And a messenger comes to the goddess and says, I'm, I'm a messenger of Shumba, king of the demons and supreme sovereign of earth and heaven. He sends me the message since all of the world belongs to him and all of its finest jewels. And so too should you, oh, precious jewel among women. You shall accompany us to my master's abode and then become his wife. Now, playfully, coquettishly, sort of feeding into their delusion. She bats her eyelashes, maybe she glances at her lovely nails, and she proclaims that, you know, you know, that's all good and well, but I made this silly vow when I was young and foolish. My vow is, you know, the only husband I would take is he who could best me in battle. (laughs) What can I do? I made this vow, and the messenger's Protest, don't be so arrogant. Who is arrogant, right? Don't be so arrogant. They're going to drag you by your hair. And she's like, well, what can I do? I made this vow. Run along and carry the news. Outraged at this response, Shumba sent forth his general. His general's name is Dumra Lochina. Dumra means smoke or smoky, and Lochina means eyes. He's not seeing straight, is he? So Dumerlochina amasses his army and they go and they confront the goddess abiding in the Malian peaks. And they proclaim that, look, you can either come willingly or we're going to have to drag you by your hair. To which she responds, 
Well, if you and your powerful forces wish to drag me by my hair, what can a lone woman like me possibly do? Do what you gotta do. With this, Duma Lochana made a move to drag her by her hair, but before he could reach her, she let out a wrathful cry. The text is like she looks at the sound. Hum. Right. To my mind, this is actually an homage to mantras and bija mantras in particular. She lets out this outcry. And he is reduced to ashes. Just by this outcry. Mantric missile, as I call it. And her lion is more than happy to take care of the rest of his army. Okay. When news of this reaches Shumba, he dispatches good old, you know, the original henchmen, Chanda and Munda, themselves to go forth. Along with an even bigger army. To do what? To bring her back and drag her forcibly by her hair. Dignified, yeah? Charming. <laughs> so they go, Chanda and Munda and the even bigger army sally forth towards the abode of the goddess, abiding resplendently in the Himalayan peaks. <laughs> and they make a mad dash to grab her by the hair, but she let out another angry outcry. From her knitted brow, this is the outrage of the goddess herself. She who was manifested by the outrage of the gods. Imagine what is manifested by the outrage of she herself. Right? So during this moment of utter outrage, you know, when you're when you're dealing with demonic forces or people intent on destroying you or great Thomas darkness ignorance, what's needed? Right? <laughs> from from her outcry, her face turned black as ink with wrath. And from her outrage near their brow sprang, sprang forth the goddess Kali, a manifestation of the mother's power. Kali was dreadful to behold, armed with sword and noose, and adorned with a garland of severed heads. She was emaciated, her body like that of a scorpion, with a lolling tongue, sunken eyes, and a cackle that filled the four directions. Kali sprang forth to single-handedly battle the army. She seized some by the hair and some by the neck, while others she pulverized underfoot. She caught their missiles in her mouth, grinding them between her teeth. Kali ravaged the army, <laughs> the enemy forces, all in one fell swoop. She then severed the heads of Chanda and Munda and brought them back to the goddess, saying playfully, here you go. Here are the heads who could not see straight, even with four eyes. I present them to you now as a trophy of our triumph. Pleased by the powers of Kali, the goddess declared, Since you have fetched me the heads of the vile Chanda and Munda, from this day forth you shall be known as Chamunda. Chamunda is one of the epithets, one of the names of the goddess. And perhaps... Uh, one of the most popular mantras uh, uttered in conjunction with the with the ritual recitation of the Devi Mahatmya, aka the Chandipata, is the mantra Om Aim Rim Klim Chamunda Yeviche. It's an homage to this form of Kali, essentially Chamunda, Durga Kali, right? Chamunda is an epithet of Kali. Kali, which is a manifestation of Durga. And so, such is the delusion of the demons. And such is the force that's needed to battle them. Now, there's a great deal, both in scholarship, actually, I think it's been somewhat tempered or corrected in recent years, for sure. But there has been a great deal of scholarly and lay voices which utterly fetishize Kali and do so out of context. A sort of celebration of wrath and gore and without the proper contextualization of the purpose of it. Right? There are those who even foolishly think of Durga Kali as warrior goddesses. It, why would billions of Hindus take their kids to temples to pray to a warrior goddess? She's understood as Amba, as the mother. 
Tigress has claws in times of need, <laughs> particularly to protect her young. And so the virulence of Kali needs to be understood as an apt and adequate response for the ignorance that is being um, faced. When one is destroying something destructive, ultimately one is preserving. So yeah, destroy anarchy, yeah, no. <laughs> there are no shortage of conflicts on the global stage right now that you can call your mind to and irrespective of where your allegiance may land, without question, um, you would have to agree that in order to succeed in combating foe, if that's how you think of it, then one needs to match forces or surpass the force of one's foe. The manifestation of Kali is both, uh, on, the, on the one hand, it's sort of an an emotional response of, of indignation and outrage at the audacity of such a one who will come and drag you by your hair unwillingly. Right? Right? Does that outrage sound familiar to any of you? Of course it does. It's also beyond this beautiful encapsulation of an emotional state. It's, 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 it's a mythic encapsulation of a pragmatic matter right, of warfare, of the mechanics of struggle and strife and combat, fighting fire with fire, so to speak. And so I think what I will do is end here for today and continue episode three in the next uh, podcast episode. Um, Keep listening, keep thinking, keep reflecting. By all means, reach out to me if I can be of service to you in any way. Uh, you can study with me at the Indian Wisdom School. You may even wish to come on one of these cool in-person Shakti retreats. Who knows? Um, I hope you've enjoyed this a fraction as much, at least, as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. And until next time, keep well. Namaste. Namaste.